Most of us, I think, live our lives as if they were prescription drug commercials. You all know the ones. I want for you to picture this, and I promise you this is actually a real commercial. It's not a parody. I'm not making it up. It's a real commercial. Envision a grandfather and a grandson sitting at a glistening kitchen island, playing tic-tac-toe together on an iPad as dad cooks scrambled eggs and looks on the two of them adoringly. Then fade to a grandmother, laughing, beaming, putting a funny knit hat she's made for her granddaughter on her granddaughter's head as the two of them giggle about the funny hat. And then finally, you fade away to a couple strolling through a park who serendipitously stumble upon a string quartet playing bubbly and happy music. Now here's what they're saying in the background. See your doctor right away if you experience new or worsening cough, chest pains, shortness of breath, diarrhea, severe stomach pain or tenderness, severe nausea or vomiting, extreme fatigue, constipation, excessive thirst or urine, swollen ankles, loss of appetite, rash, itching, headache, confusion, hallucinations, muscle or joint pain, flushing, fever, or weakness. These are not all the possible side effects. But I am going to stop there, because if you're like me, you're convinced you've got all these side effects and you're not even on the meds. <laughs> Most of us live lives that are something like this commercial, all right and well on the surface, but just beneath that shiny veneer lies a myriad of ways in which our bodies are falling or will fall apart. Our lives in this way are severely disjointed, ludicrously disintegrated, much like these commercials. What we need most of all is something our simultaneously death-obsessed and death-denying culture is ill-equipped to provide. That is, an ars moriendi, or some way to learn the art of dying. This is what Ash Wednesday is for. Ash Wednesday tells us all a truth we spend most of our waking moments trying desperately to forget. The truth that we will die. And not just some of us, all of us. It does so in order that we might act and live in ways that accord with that fact, with the fact that we will not live indefinitely, which for better or worse is the way we live most of the time. Christians do not believe that God originally intended us to die, but they believe rather that death follows on the fall of humanity and the entrance of sin into the world. This is something you can see in the great creation narratives in the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. The second chapter of Genesis says that the Lord God formed the human being from the dust of the ground and breathed into the human being's nostrils the breath of life. And it is only actually in the event that the human being eats of the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it should die. Human beings are, in other words, mortal, capable of dying, okay? We're made of dust, but we were not originally intended to die. Presumably because, as many of the early church fathers thought, we would live off of a kind of spiritual photosynthesis God originally intended us to live directly off of God's own life, much as plants live off the light of the sun. It was true that we were dust, but it was not actually necessary that to dust we should return. Although, of course, now it is. The words that we speak at the imposition of ashes are taken, actually, from the next chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve, having eaten of the forbidden tree, God has to explain the ramifications of that choice to them. 
And at the end of God's explanation of what they've done, God says, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, Christians believe, moreover, that God dies headlong into this sorry state of affairs we have landed ourselves in. That in the words of one of our Eucharistic prayers, when we have become subject to evil and death, God in his mercy sent Jesus Christ, his only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to him, the God and Father of all. God, that is, seeing that we had become subject to death, elects to save us from death by dying himself. So that in doing so, in living a mortal human life, just like ours, he could bring the whole of that mortal life back into living, breathing communion with himself, as he had originally intended all human life to be. Though on account of our sin and brokenness, the restoration of that communion will subsequently take the form of the cross, of a death that leads beyond it to resurrection, of a dying that yields to deeper life. Ash Wednesday is meant to deliver a devastating shock to our modern systems of escapism and distraction. That, in the words of Hanser's von Balthasar, though the world wants to live and rise again before it dies, the love of Christ wants to die in order to rise again in the form of God on the other side of death. Now, this does not mean that I think Christians should rush headlong towards dying, okay? By no means. But neither does it pretend, or neither does it mean that we ought to pretend as though we're never going to have to die. Neither does it mean that we ought to pretend that we will not one day be called to give back to God the very last bits of ourselves every last drop of who and what we are in the hope and the trust that in Christ nothing whatsoever will be lost. This is the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying, according to Christians. And it changes, I think, the way we live our whole lives long. The first thing knowing we die does is add seriousness to our repentance. And this is the other theme of today's fast. Our moral lives, like our physical ones, are fragile. Being good is actually quite difficult for us to come by. At least it is in my experience especially in a world where it seems as if I'm always choosing between the lesser of two evils rather than between good and evil. In many ways, being good actually goes against the grain of how we experience ourselves to be put together. The name for which condition, according to theologians, is original sin. It means that human beings are downright prone to hurt one another to betray one another, and to live in ways neglectful of the harm we inflict on each other and on the whole of creation. That we will die means that there is no time to lose in making amends for our faults, and that so far as possible, we should strive to recognize in one another the same moral fragility that we know is true of ourselves even and especially, perhaps, in those who have hurt us, awful and painful as that is to do. Reconciliation of this deep sort is neither pretty 
nor painless. Only Jesus can give us the grace to bear it. The second thing knowing we will die does is give us that salient urgency without which we will forget really to live the life we know is worth living. And that, I think, is genuinely good news. It's why Christians throughout the world have today gone to churches like this one and received ashes on their forehead, just as you will, and be told you're going to die, sometimes with joy on their faces. See, I want for you to think for a moment about everything you have sacrificed on the altar of, I will get to that someday. Or on the altar of, if I can just make it through this year, next year will be better. Or on the altar of, I can do that when I'm retired. Or the altar of, it'll be worth it. Was it? And maybe, maybe the answer is that it was, but the test in each case, I believe, is whether it can stand toe to toe with the ashes that will be imposed upon your foreheads in just a moment. And I do want you all to know that all those altars are not God's. They're yours and you do not have to sacrifice upon them if you don't feel called to. I believe that this Lent we could all stand to benefit by taking a good hard look at our lives, at the ways we expend our precious and limited time, energy, health, and resources in the hard, unflinching light of remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. If you are unhappy with what you find, pray to our Lord this Lent, not next Lent, this Lent, to give you the grace to change your life. He can give you the courage to die, the freedom in which is the courage really to live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.